Hello, good morning everyone. Uh, welcome to the webinar Challenges for Feminist Leadership in Higher Education Institutions, which is organized by two Horizon 2020 projects, Gearing Roles and the Gender Equality Academy. My name is Vasya Madesi. I am uh, the project coordinator of the Gender Equality Academy and I will present you a few words about uh, the project and today's agenda before we start. So without any further delay, I will just share my screen for starting the presentation. All right. So, uh, before we start, what the project is about, what is the challenge that we are trying to tackle? Currently, there are many gender equality programs, projects, and a great gain knowledge in uh, gender analysis and uh, gender equality in general. But it remains rarely appropriated within research projects, while there are large differences among research performing organizations in various countries, and there is a small proportion of researchers and practitioners that are familiar with the theoretical and methodological concepts of gender and feminist scholarship. What the project does is that as an Horizon 2020 project, which develops uh, and implements a high quality capacity building program, it tries to uh, train people on gender equality in research, innovation and higher education. Our training offer includes in-person training, interactive participatory workshops, interactive webinars, summer schools, an open collaborative online course, which was concluded, but a second version will be launched on 2021, and train the trainer sessions. As you understand, uh, due to the pandemic, at the moment we are only able to offer online training but uh, we are trying and aiming at uh, highly participatory uh, workshops, even in an online format. And of course, webinars. Uh, we are a partnership, so we have strong experience in uh, training methods and materials. And this is uh, a snapshot of us. Uh, I would like to let you know that today's webinars and uh, all the webinar series of Gender Equality Academy are uploaded on our YouTube channel, which is Gender Equality Academy EU, where you can subscribe and attend all our past sessions. And uh, I would also like to tell you what is coming up this October. We have uh, open one online training for the 14th of October and another webinar is coming uh, very soon. The registration link will be uh, available very soon for you. So for uh, today's webinar, uh, I will uh, pass the floor to Maria Lopez, uh, who is the project coordinator of Gearing Roles, and she will present you what Gearing Roles is also all about. We will have a lecture by Fiona McKay, and uh, um, our discussant, we have a slight change on our agenda, will, uh, will be uh, Maria today. Uh, we will also have a Q&A session, so you can type your questions on the Q&A uh, box uh, on, uh, underneath the screen, and then we will have uh, a wrap up and uh, some conclusions. So thank you very much for the attention. Uh, I would like to let you know that we are live tweeting on Gearing Roles and uh, G Academy, so you can join us with your impressions. And uh, um, I hope that uh, you will enjoy today's uh, lecture. Thank you very much. And I pass the floor to Maria. Thank you very much, Bastia. Welcome everyone to this second uh, webinar on leadership organized between GIA Academy and Gearing Roles. Gearing Roles is an A2020 project uh, that aims uh, to uh, design, implement and evaluate six gender equality plans within six European institutions. And we are supported by other four partners that join us in this a challenge that not only uh, try to design and implement the gender equality plans, but also uh, try to challenge and transform their gender roles and identities linked to professional careers and work towards real institutional change. Our project is structured in nine work packets and these two webinars, the one that we have already um, developed and this one are framed under work packets five, which is uh, 
on leadership and decision making. So I have the pleasure to introduce you to Fiona McKay. Professor Fiona McKay is a Scottish feminist uh, political scientist whose work examines the ways in which gender equality is reinforced through political and legal and social institutions. Uh, she is interested in the, uh, the extent to which institutions may be designed or reformed to promote gender justice, inclusion and women's human rights. Fiona has also served in a variety of academic leaders uh, management uh, roles at the University of Edinburgh, including as Dean and Head of the School of Social and Political Science, one of the largest in the UK. She currently di uh, directs the Gender ID Interdisciplinary Hub uh, at the University of Edinburgh and is also founding of, and co-director of FIN, the Feminist and Institutionalism International Network. So we are so pleased to have you today with us, Fiona, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Maria. Um, so good morning, good afternoon and good evening to everybody. Um, I'm really delighted to have been asked to speak today and I'd like to thank Maya, Natasha, um, Vazia, Lucy and others um, and the other organisers from Gearing Roles and the Gender Equality Academy for inviting me. My talk today is based on a longer paper which is about to be published in uh, Political Studies Review and it explores um, the, the opportunities and the practical, political and theoretical dilemmas posed for academic feminists who enter uh, leader manager positions uh, in what's usually called the neoliberal academy. I've got some slides coming up um, and you'll have to give me a minute to share the screen, but I want us to think about this as a conversation and I'd be really uh, interested in hearing the experiences of others. So if you just let me share my screen. And here we go. Couple of minutes, hopefully it's going to be there. Yes, there it is. Okay, so thanks very much. Um, so as Sarah Ahmed notes, to live a feminist life is to be a feminist at work. And I focus in the paper and in the presentation today on a specific set of change makers at work, what are called academic feminist managers. So I'm trying to make the distinction between those I call academic feminists, um, for whom uh, their professional and political identities uh, intertwine, and academics who are feminists, but whose professional uh, identities um, and uh, uh, scholarly expertise uh, lie elsewhere. Now, of course, there are many other sorts of feminists and equality champions at every level of the university in academic and in professional services roles. Um, I've spent a good deal of the last 15 years or so, as, as Maria said, in different sorts of management and leadership positions. But what I want to reflect upon today in particular is my experience of serving as an executive dean and head of school. Um, so a school of uh, a large school of social and political sciences in a public research intensive UK uh, university. And in doing so, um, I'm seeking to contribute to debates about, if you like, the radical potential of insider strategies for those engaged in what whole call and hassle call um, specific, deliberate and often exhausting uh, institutional change work. And a caveat is that my experiences are, of course, rooted in a particular institution and a particular institutional system. So lessons may not transfer straightforwardly uh, to other contexts, but I hope they'll be useful uh, nonetheless. So the questions that animate my uh, reflections are these. Um, what can feminists do when they take on management roles? How do academic feminists experience being simultaneously uh, the embodiment of institutional authority and oppositional knowledge? What are the opportunities and constraints within which these management roles, um, uh, what are the opportunities and constraints within these management roles to exercise feminist leadership and to affect particularly in an environment when academic managers are increasingly pressured to adopt private sector values and practices through um, new managerialism? To what extent are there opportunities, therefore, to work with the grain of an institution to challenge the gendered status quo within? And what are the compromises uh, or ambivalences required to work from the inside as a tempered radical? 
uh, in the neoliberal university. Now I'm getting a funny message. Are people mm. seeing the slides? Ah, uh, yeah. Hi, yeah. hi, Pia. Oh. Hi, everyone. Uh, it is uh, like block uh, in the first slide. Maybe you can um, try to put the full screen again and move. Okay. On. Let me try again. Uh, yeah. So sorry about this. Is the technology is okay? Yeah. Um, I'm not at our okay now they're working yeah. now they're working again okay I wonder then if I maybe keep it like this or let me let me just go again and see what happens sometimes it needs to be uh, typed type yeah, so twice. can people see a slide called room at the top uh, yes we cannot Excellent. see the full screen but maybe we can leave them like that if it's not okay so working. for me it's showing a full screen Right, okay, um, sorry about that. Okay, so I started with an image from the British newspaper, The Guardian's Higher Education Series, Two VCs On. And it's Valerie Amos, the first black woman to lead a UK university. Um, she was vice chancellor from 2015 to 2020 of SOAS in London, uh, and is now master of University College Oxford. And the second image is of Shearer West, who's been vice chancellor at Nottingham University since 2017. In 2020, only 39 of the top 200 universities in the Times Higher Education World University rankings are run by women. Uh, and in the UK, women make up only around 20% of vice chancellors. But the point I'm using it for today is to illustrate that while still rare, women are achieving important, important leadership roles at first tier, for example, vice chancellors, uh, presidents, etc. Second tier, so pro vice chancellors and third tier, and that's deans and equivalents uh, inside universities in both the global north and the global south. And this is taking place across different countries, across different uh, and diverse policy uh, landscapes in terms of gender equality legislation and policies. And these include women with feminist sensibilities. So both Valerie Amos and Shira West consider themselves feminists and are committed to uh, improving uh, equality and diversity. Uh, Shira West in that interview uh, spoke about her desire for women to keep fighting for top jobs in academia until people no longer expect the title to come with a beard or a tie. So moving on to my next slide. And that's to give some context on gender and management in higher education. Um, sorry, if you not try again yeah. to move because it is still um, to room at the top. Right. Have you got uh, context now? Nope. Uh, X again, the, the full screen. We apologize for these no. technicalities. Right, I can okay. also It was working share. before, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay now, is that better like that? Yes, yes, now we can yeah. see the next slide. Okay, um, so what I'm going to do is just try and make that as large as possible, uh, right. but obviously. Okay, okay. Yeah. right, sorry about that. Okay, so <laughs> context now. Uh, there's a growing body of literature on women in management positions in the university, in the contemporary university. And as a scholar myself of gender in politics, uh, it's clear that many of the barriers and issues are very similar across different fields. So issues such as those of supply and demand and their complex interconnection, of motivations, ambitions or lack of ambition, and the experiences of women in the pipeline. Um, so typically work on women in the second tier or the third tier positions, such as the level where I was situated. And these studies have revealed a range of structural and cultural uh, inequalities that are faced um, by women who aspire for, for management uh, roles. Um, and these include the discriminatory effects of homosocial networks, practices, exclusionary norms and values, the gendered division of labour inside and outside the academy, the lack of mobility, and processes of gender devaluation experienced by women despite their senior roles. So whilst formal gender equality and diversity policies and initiatives have proliferated in the university sector, including those that seek to rectify the over-representation of white men in decision-making positions, the, implement the implementation gap remains 
uh, glaringly large. And the literature, literature also highlights considerable um, professional and, and personal costs and dilemmas for female academics in seeking uh, or undertaking positions of authority and power in universities, where despite formal inclusion, uh, these multiple and systematic barriers remain. However, they also uh, recount opportunities for agency, for ambition, uh, for pleasure, for feelings of efficacy, um, and of female academic leader managers thriving, uh, sometimes in fact to their own surprise. Now I want to talk a little bit now about why study feminist academic leader managers and there are actually being rather few studies which focus directly on feminists as manager academics. Now this might reflect uh, a reluctance among academic feminists to research management as a field of practice or to seek management roles in their institutions, not least because of these long-standing debates um, in feminism about the extent to which there are opportunities uh, to work with the grain of an institution uh, as uh, outsiders within or tempered radicals without ending up being co-opted, compromised, uh, complicit. Nonetheless, some studies do suggest that feminist academic managers do appear to have the potential to transform their institutions in feminist inspired ways, using their outsider status to act as change agents, moving uh, beyond uh, gendered traditional forms of collegiality and new managerialist approaches, um, albeit within significant constraints. So according to the literature, the resources provided by feminist scholarship and practice enable feminist academic managers to develop these critical analyses of trends in higher education. Uh, so, for example, towards quality assessment and management, performance based cultures and so on, as well as a range of strategies for resistance, mitigation and change. On the other hand, others caution that the belief that academic feminists can lead differently in the contemporary managerialized global academy is misguided and, and is a form of what Berlin calls cruel optimism. Right, moving on to the next slide. Um, so the context, if you like, in which we manage neoliberalism, I want to make a note here. So feminist academics, of course, find themselves doing managing in particular sets of cultural, social and economic conditions. And the premise of the neoliberal university is now well established. Um, these encompass the trends of internationalization, marketization, corporatization, which have seen the increased commodification of education and research. We've seen the intensification of work, the erosion of academic autonomy and the transformation of students into consumers. And new managerialism reflects these influences and is characterised as the adoption of corporate values and practices from the private sector to the public sector, uh, where it's increasingly displaced more traditional forms of academic leadership. Now, I agree with this. However, I find that monolithic versions of this thesis are unhelpful and they neglect diversity and variability. And what I would argue uh, as both a feminist academic and somebody who's been a manager is that it's instead more fruitful to envisage a neoliberalizing rather than a fully formed neoliberal academy. So on the ground, we experience variability and differentiation, which are differences that matter. And not all trends associated with neoliberalism and new, managers, new managerialism need be inherently unprogressive, including professionalisation, accreditation, accountability, quality assurance and so on. Many of these trends, particularly those that have increased transparency, have been really helpful in easing the entry of marginalised groups and knowledges into the academy, or making visible the low profile service work typically undertaken by women. And it's also the case that important continuities can be discerned. It's not the case that the old university uh, was um, inclusive or open. Um, there are important continuities, some progressive, but some exclusionary and paternalistic and colonialist, and yet others with mixed effects. So these, if you like, set the context for the challenges, dilemmas and opportunities of being an academic feminist leader in the neoliberal uh, academy. Moving on to my next slide. So 
as Maria said, I'm a feminist political scientist and I work in the fields of political representation, political institutions uh, and institutional and uh, policy change. I guess I'm something of an accidental academic, um, having had a 10 year career as a journalist, including managing a news desk before I went to university. Um, after my undergrad, I then had to sort of think about what I wanted to do. And I went on to do a PhD, at least in part, because at the time it seemed you could much better combine uh, work and bringing up a small child as a single parent in academia than you could in the media. Now, some people might be laughing hollowly at this point, but that's how it felt then. And at some point I morphed into a proactive academic leader. Uh, and as Maria has said, I've held a number of academic leader positions uh, of one sort uh, or another. And in 2014, I put myself forward for Dean and head of the School of Social and Political Science and served a four year uh, term. Now, why did I take the role? And I think the short answer is because I was asked uh, and that's a surprisingly common answer in other instances too. So for example, that's what many women in politics say as well. And I think that po points to the importance of proactive recruitment. The longer and messier answer is that I did it for lots of reasons. So some of these relate to my attachment, despite its flaws, to my own greedy institution, the University of Edinburgh, uh, and my feminist commitment. And without sounding too pious, because I cared about and felt responsible for the school and my colleagues and I felt loyalty to my university and support for many, not all, but many of its goals. And because as a feminist, I'd spent decades arguing for equal opportunities and the need to challenge male, pale and stale power hierarchies and thought that this was the moment I needed to walk the walk. Because I guess I thought it might help make women in leadership a new normal including the potential role model effect of having a, a feminist lesbian, an adult returner, and a one-time single parent at the helm. And I guess if I'm honest, uh, it's also because it felt good to have my leadership legitimacy, my competence presumed uh, by both the status quo power elites and colleagues. And that's not always the, experiences, the experience of feminists in the academy, as we know. Finally, I took on the role despite doubts and concerns about it taking me away from research and teaching, from my academic friendship groups uh, and so on, because I wanted the levers and resources that come with an executive management position in contrast to those in many other sorts of academic leadership roles. So as Irish um, feminist and former Dean Pat O'Connor notes, the lesson learned is that positional power is a means to get things done. So what is the role? So the role of the head of school or executive dean, uh, according to the university, uh, occupies a central position in the leadership structure of the university. Now, Sue Shepherd talks about deans as operating like um, uh, feudal lords, uh, to which my reply is, I wish. But it is a, in the system within which I work, they're responsible for budgets, for people and resources. They have important strategic and planning powers. They have influence up the way uh, as well as down the way. Uh, and they have both internal and external uh, facing responsibilities. So in my case, I was responsible for around 300 staff, around 3000 students and had a budget of, uh, of, of multiple millions. So there's fierce debate in the business literature about gender and, and management. Um, some of the work is, is, is really nuanced and thought provoking. And I've put in uh, my middle um, visual is the front cover of Managing Like a Man, uh, Judy Wiseman's classic book. Um, others, uh, particularly in sort of the popular management literature, are quite dubious and rest on gendered stereotypes or, in the case of Cheryl Stanberg's, lean in on fixing women. Uh, and I don't want to really get into that there, but what I do want to ask is, is there a feminist style of management? Now, I'm quite sceptical that there's a distinct set of rules comprising a feminist style of management. 
But I do agree with those that argue that feminist academic practice consists of a disposition, including attentiveness to unequal power relations and social justice, to relationships uh, and boundaries, uh, boundaries of inclusion and exclusion and attention to forms of marginalization and to self-reflection. So therefore, for me, at a minimum, a feminist style of management would attempt to steer clear of control, domination and competitiveness. It would be open to one's own vulnerabilities and limitations. It would seek to use positional power to open up opportunities for other people and endeavour to build shared capacity. So it's apparent to me that there's a considerable overlap between feminist management and the markers of feminist leadership in seeking to hold and exercise power helpfully. My approach is also informed by my work as a feminist political scientist studying gender reform efforts, particularly uh, during periods of restructuring and institutional change and the efforts of um, insider tempered radicals, so feminist bureaucrats, legislators and jurists who work within existing structures to challenge the gendered status quo despite the perils of co-option and complicity. And tempered radicals is a, a concept I found very, very useful. Tempered radicals, according to, to Mayerson and Scully, are individuals who are committed both to their organisations and to a cause, identity or, ide or ideology that's at odds with that dominant institutional culture. So their radicalism drives them to challenge the status quo, um, as indeed does their very presence as individuals who don't fit. Um, and their temperedness reflects the way in which they've been toughened by their sense of struggle and ambivalence and their inclination to practice moderation in their interactions with power holders and in their efforts to effect change. So the emphasis is on insider strategies of seeking incremental change through what we call small wins and by authentic actions. And this concept has really informed and helped my own practice and provided me with insights to make sense of my experience. And the, pre, the, promote, the approach also resonates, I think, with a recent turning away from what Eshley uh, and my Gusha call the strong co-optation thesis. So this is feminist critiques that deny the possibilities of political agency by, according to Newman, folding the achievements of feminism into accounts of neoliberalism, assuming feminists who pursue institutional change by means of insider strategies, gender equality policies, programmes, etc., are somehow seduced or deluded. And it marks, I think, a turn towards more pragmatic approaches. So what I want to do in the rest of my time here is to talk through four either lessons or, or vignettes. OK, so my first one is about everyday feminism. So everyday feminism and academic management and the idea about norms and normalising. So working with colleagues, I try to shape, nudge or affirm the development of an organisational culture that takes values of equality and diversity seriously. And these efforts to normalise feminist values have sometimes taken the form of what um, Lali Berti and her colleagues call stealth feminism. So that means that instead of explicitly flagging up each set of arguments or, or critique as feminist, you instead assume that it's just the normal lens for viewing the world and you assume everybody else is thinking that way too. I've put in place measures to recognise and value different sorts of academic capital and experience, including through reward, um, recruitment and promotions processes, as much as school autonomy allows, but there is quite a deal of discretion there. There have been small wins, like, for example, female colleagues being promoted whilst they're on or just returning from maternity leave. The validation of well-rounded promotion cases that recognise service and teaching and progress and um, progress that we've made towards closing the professorial gender pay gap through using the neoliberal uh, instrument of benchmarking. What I've tried to do is to make visible and to elevate academic good citizenship, which is so often, as we know, practiced by women, although of course not only by women, and to promote it as a form of leadership. And in so doing, I've been able to an extent to redefine the gendered characteristics required of those in positions of authority within the school. 
I've also worked to try and promote the message that equality's work is for everyone. So for example, research into Athena Swan, which is a gender equality accreditation scheme for universities in the UK, and there are similar sorts of charter marks in, in other systems. The research showed that the onerous task, and it is a really onerous task, of preparing submissions for award had disproportionately fallen on junior women and they were often just expected to do it on top of their day jobs. In our case what I did was I recruited a senior male professor, professor to lead our submission. Uh, he was in fact our top social statistician uh, and he was an expert on the organisational culture of the European Commission so I figured he obviously had experience of how to uh, look out at uh, dysfunctional institutions. The labour of all members of the self-assessment scheme, drawn from across different grades and characteristics, academics and professional services staff, was recognised in the work allocation model. What I've tried to do is promote a school culture that values methodological pluralism, interdisciplinarity, co-production of curricula, social justice and global and local connectedness, all of which flatten hierarchies and help to validate the scholarship and teaching of feminist academics, as well as other critical and engaged scholars. I've given space to and reinforced measured critical responses to and interpretations of the various performance frameworks within which we work in the UK relating to teaching and research. And this is informed uh, by feminist research on the gendered and racialized nature of knowledge making and measurement and the gendered and racialized assumptions underpinning classifications of academic excellence. So the lesson is that the exercise of everyday feminism can result in, in wins, small wins to be sure, but wins. Using positional authority, I've been able to set the tone. I've not been able to address systematic, systemic uh, structural constraints, but I have tried to enable a local institutional narrative that chips away at cultural and institutional norms and creates the space uh, for solidarity. My second vignette or, or lesson is at the academic feminist manager uh, seizing the moment. Um, so an academic feminist as manager can utilize her positional power and resources and her institutional knowledge to seize moments of what Jane Mansbridge calls institutional readiness. Uh, to move forward, uh, and I've done that in this instance, to move forward feminist education uh, and women, gender uh, and feminist study scholarship. So this was the case with the development of the university's gender initiative. Now, there'd been countless conversations over the years about how best to connect feminist and gender scholarship across different schools and disciplines in what is a large and decentralised university, how to make research led teaching options more visible to students and how to identify gaps and build capacity. Within my own school there had been benign neglect despite well evidenced cases of the need for further investment. However in 2014 by strategically aligning with campaign demands of student leaders who are you know as a result of being seen more and more as consumers actually have quite a, a significant voice in the institution um, so by strategically aligning with the campaign demands of student leaders and, if you like, instrumentalising the case uh, for new interdisciplinary gender studies provision, including around graduate attributes and employability, I was able to combine my experience as an academic feminist with my positional power as dean to provide institutional leadership to drive forward the initiative. And this was in contrast to earlier efforts that had founded without an institutional lead or adequate resources, which is the downside of decentralization for interdisciplinary and precarious disciplinary fields. So this resulted in new hires, the creation of a successful university-wide introductory uh, interdisciplinary course, the Gender in the Contemporary World, um, and also the launch of a cross-university virtual hub, um, Gender Ed, uh, which connects scholars, teachers, and students. So, the lessons I draw from this is seize the moment, have a proposal in your back pocket. This is an example of using power helpfully uh, by seizing a moment of institutional readiness and using institutional knowledge and levers to make things happen. 
My third uh, vignette or lesson is of the academic feminist manager as the man. And this relates to an instance in which I probably felt my most conflicted over my responsibilities as an academic manager uh, to ensure compliance with the university's rules around migrant uh, workers and students. So the university, uh, sorry, the UK government has an increasingly hostile uh, policy regime around uh, immigration. And I think that that's, that's well known. Uh, Neera Yuval Davis and her colleagues set out the ways in which recent immigration legislation and policy has shifted the focus from external to internal borders in what she calls everyday bordering. So through technologies of surveillance and monitoring, the government has shifted the onus of checking the immigration status of service users, tenants, employees, students, workers, onto ordinary citizens, onto landlords, hospitals, schools and employers, including universities. So as a manager, I was legally responsible for ensuring compliance and ensuring compliance in a way that the university interpreted its, its responsibilities, which at times seemed um, to be polite, more cumbersome or more stringent than practice elsewhere in the sector. So colleagues objected to the underlying policies of the UK immigration regime and to the requirement that they participate in everyday bordering, for example, through the monitoring of student engagement, uh, through the uh, rolling out of new staff whereabouts reporting. And resistance took several forms, including dissent, resistance, obstruction and non-compliance. Now, as a head of school, I could ensure there was space for debate and dissent. I could and I did represent the views of colleagues to central management, to advocate for workarounds, for light touch implementation, for school discretion. I sought, if you like, to protect and deflect. And along with many heads of school, I kept pressure upon university leaders to continue their own lobbying efforts behind the scenes and therefore not widely known to colleagues um, with the Home Office to challenge uh, policy. I mean, personally, I agreed with colleagues' critique and condemnation. However, ultimately, I was responsible for ensuring school compliance and demonstrably so in the context of a looming audit that would monitor and assess the extent to which the university was fulfilling its legal requirements. So I did have to make clear that I was prepared to take disciplinary action against my colleagues in the last resort. I was frustrated that for some colleagues, political resistance in the abstract trumped or at least obscured the real and material dangers to students and staff that non-compliance would bring. In other words, the loss of the university's highly trusted sponsor status and the summary expulsion of all visa holders. So for me, it was a stressful and isolating time. I felt anxious, beleaguered, alone. I felt estranged from otherwise like-minded colleagues. I was accused of being an agent of the neoliberal university and the racist state. In the retelling, it's clear that in the eyes of many of my colleagues, I had become the man, the embodiment of institutional authority and the symbol of the establishment. So looking back, I think a number of lessons can be drawn. The first is that as an academic manager, there are times when your discretion and your creative workarounds are exhausted. And you must then manage in order to meet organisational imperatives and legal responsibilities. In such circumstances, for me, the concept of tempered radical has been helpful in understanding and navigating the tensions of such dilemmas and for making me hold on to that ethic of ambivalence. It's also the case that, I suppose, with little room for manoeuvre, achieving a least worst outcome is a form of small win. My fourth and last lesson is academic feminist manager as gender stereotype, it took a woman. So I've been struck, not surprised, but struck at the amount of emotional labor that's been required in this management position. There have been strong expectations and therefore considerable burdens uh, in terms of the emotional and pastoral support that I've needed to provide to colleagues across grades and experience. There've been times, I've got to admit, that I've been overwhelmed by the affective load, absorbing the effects of occupational stress, dealing with conflict, anxiety and disappointment. 
And now this was in marked contrast to the expectations on my male predecessor, who was seen as dynamic and entrepreneurial, but also hands off and externally focused. And for me, it's evidence, clear evidence of a gendered logic of appropriateness at play. And the literature suggests a general trend in that when women take up senior posts, their positional status and authority tends to be downplayed while the service dimension of their role uh, is emphasized, even exaggerated in the process of what Monroe and her colleagues call gender devaluation. And I found that in conversations with, with other academic feminist managers, that counterparts have noted the downgrading and subtle dismissal by colleagues of much of their daily work as being uncreative or akin to housework. As the case with other feminists, other women managers rather, I've struggled to avoid being put in a motherly role. Um, but nonetheless, when hard decisions have been taken, I, I've encountered reactions that I suspect are powered at least in part, by a sense of me as a bad mother. On the other hand, I've had to defend my preferred soft, uh, so-called feminised management style of consultation, coaching and collaboration. I've had to defend it as effective, strategic and values based rather than as weak or a natural disposition. So there have been multiple everyday ways in which I've been brought down to size and achievements have been minimised through lazy essentialism and gender devaluing. But the following anecdote provides a good example. About halfway through my headship, I was in conversation with a senior and distinguished male professor. You're doing a great job as Dean Fiona, he said. And I thought he might be referencing some of the initiatives that we delivered, investment in professional services and young academic talent, new academic programmes, teaching innovations, equality and diversity, research performance. But no, the cafe, he said, will be your greatest achievement. And of course, it took a woman. Now, the creation of the cafe was a hard fought win and a much needed addition to the school. But this falling back on gender stereotypes naturalizes the association of women with the provisioning of others. It reduced my strategic vision for a space of community to a disposition, as well as downplay my overall record as a management leader, a manager leader. I mean, I felt like saying to him, you don't need ovaries to understand the strategic significance of good community and good coffee. But hey. And I do feel ambivalence. You know, on the one hand, care work is important and it's a valued part of my own practice. But this begs the question of how can the gendering of this sort of labour be undone? And it's worth recognised as a crucial part of leadership for women and men. OK, so thank you for, for bearing with me. I've got a, just a few conclusions. And that's that over and above issues of equal opportunities and, and individual career aspirations, um, over and above the empowering effect of role models and the potential to disrupt gendered norms through the presence of women in powerful position, I think that the focus on academic feminists in management is important because, as in other aspects of their practice, they're committed to progressive social change beyond individual remedies. So I think that academic management positions offer the opportunity within constraints to exercise feminist leadership and is an important form of insider strategy. I've experienced management as loss, as loss of self, loss of important research identities and loss of some relationships. However, like others, I've also experienced management as a position of visibility, personal authenticity and, and effectiveness. I've been affirmed by line, my line managers, including the university's most senior leaders um, and by my colleagues, well, most of them, as a successful and effective academic uh, leader manager. So whilst being clear sighted about the constraints under which middle managers like myself operate, my own experience has also been of opportunities to hold and to exercise power helpfully. Now, there are lots of ways of exercising uh, leadership, and I'm not suggesting that management is the only route. Uh, a principal dilemma for academic feminists is whether or not to participate in an era of leaderism, of managerialism, of marketization, consumerism and audit. Should feminists aspire at all to take on positions of authority, 
with top-down power dynamics and the perils of complicity in the neoliberal academy. So I think the question is an important one and the potential pitfalls are serious, but it needs to be considered along with its corollary, which is, is it better then to leave it to non-feminists to steer, shape and exert power in the academy? Is it enough to rely only on strategies of resistance or critique from the margins? University management, VCs, pro VCs, deans and heads of school all do important identity work and steer the values of the academy. So I end with the question of where do academic feminists need to be if they seek to challenge ide ideologies that justify gender inequality, uh, uh, if they want to change prevailing patterns of control over resources and to transform institutions uh, that it reinforce existing power relations, or to put that a little bit less grandly, to make working lives more, li more livable and less unfair. And I suggest that we need to be in multiple places and at all levels, including in middle and senior management, seeking to hold and exercise power helpfully to bring about structural and cultural change. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fiona. I think it was really an interesting and challenging uh, talk. Um, I will uh, now give some thoughts on the on the talk you just uh, gave, and then we will open the floor for questions and, and answers. So, uh, for me, the most challenging uh, concept or the most challenging uh, issue that you mentioned is the, the concept of uh, temper radicals because it shows that uh, it offers a different theory of organizational change. Change is not always top down and oft often comes from the middle of our organization. It leads to effective change. Leaders aren't always at, poli at uh, positional leaders. They might uh, have less visibility, but they can achieve also uh, those small wins that are really important. Uh, temper radicals work within the systems, which has pros and cons, as you mentioned. So it links to your first reflection. How do academic feminists experience being at the same time the embodiment of institutional authority and the source of oppositional change? And it also links to the institutional change um, uh, importance uh, of analyzing the state of play and understanding the concept of the institution where you are applying this institutional change. So uh, for me, I think that temporary radicals can be uh, uh, key players uh, as, as insiders and key allies for achieving institutional change. Also, I think that temper radicals offer a constellation of small strategies that lead to small wins. As Sally Correll from Stanford University said, the, the change uh, we can realistically make in any of instance are often small or imperfect, but I have decided I can live with that and we have to start from, so from somewhere. So there is a, a need uh, to cooperate between temper radicals uh, between us. We need to, uh, to collaborate with each other. The second thought is related to the third vignette that you mentioned, the vignette about the man that is linked also with uh, the stereotypical uh, beliefs around uh, feminist leaderships and uh, leadership roles. So uh, even you saw your sex sexism about the feminist style of management. I think that uh, your talk also uh, is linked with the features that uh, Binkenburg and Van Hengen uh, describe when talking about the stereotypical beliefs about leadership styles. They describe that there are some descriptive beliefs that are those who are typical attributes of men and women, those that they do have for leadership. But they also add, uh, talk about prescriptive beliefs, those ideal and desiderable attributes, those that they should have for being good leaders. So the different perceptions between prescriptive beliefs and descriptive beliefs could mean that path to leadership may become more difficult for women that, that, than for men. Also Van Hengen in her study, Gender Context and Leadership Styles, a field study, argues that female or feminist manager in a man-dominated environment, and higher education institutions are, of course, one of those, are expected to use leadership style that suit the men's world in order to maintain their status. 
So this can limit their potential for a pro uh, progressive change, social change, but also have personal implications, as you mentioned, personal costs for feminist managers who again experience being institutional authority and a source of oppositional change. So my third uh, thought is then why to take the role? Also, when you mentioned this gender devaluation uh, in your four vignette, uh, uh, you mentioned Monroe's uh, this, uh, definition of uh, gender devaluation, the position, uh, positional status and authority of female leaders or managers that tends to be downplayed while the uh, service dimension of the role uh, they occupy is emphasized, right? So uh, this gender devaluation can result on assuming that women accomplishment were routinely written off by male colleagues and not by women's own accomplishment. Uh, and this is also linked to the academic domestic wor uh, work that uh, women usually perform in, in universities and research institutions. And for me, this uh, has a clear link to the meritocracy discourse. Uh, Cheryl Hart from the University of Leeds asks, when does merit, uh, merit began, begin and who decides what merit is? Her research found that there are differences, not only on how leaders come to define merit, but also how they promote the values of merit-based systems when they face unmerit unmeritocratic practices. So this gender devaluation also appeared in the qualitative uh, research that we made for our own leading roles in institutional assessments uh, before designing our gender equality plans. So in particular, there is a Spanish game of words that combines uh, cargo, uh, the male word that means uh, position, with carga, uh, the female word that means burden. And some of the leaders mentioned that once that they become the leaders, the position became the burden. So this game of word was uh, a really um, uh, example of how service dimension is emphasized, resulting in really heavy workloads. But this also leads us to talk about agency and the link between agency and resistances. Uh, Sue Shepard from University of Kent and her work on structure and agency says that individuals agency, the capacity to act and to adapt is assumed to take place within a structural context that are culturally shaped but where different aspects such as geographical mobility can play an important role. So she also mentions that when dismissing career progression, some women may also reflect a self-preservation strategy in an attempt to avoid the cruel optimism of aspiring to something that they believe they are statistically unlikely to achieve. She quotes Morley here. So this brings us again to the concept of temper radicals. And I would like to end by quoting uh, Audrey Lord in her essay uh, from uh, learning from the 60s. When she says, to refuse to participate in the shaping of our future is to give it up. Do not be misled into passivity either by false security, they don't mean me, or by despair, there is nothing we can do. Each of us must find our work and do it. So I think this, this quote is a, a good summary for the, the, the chances and the opportunities you mentioned that we have as temper radicals, as feminist managers or leaders. And uh, I think that is um, a good uh, quote to close my reflections. So with this, I open the floor uh, first to you if you want to uh, reply something and then we will open the floor for questions and, and answers. Hi, I just wanted to say, Maria, that, that, that I really enjoyed your, your reflections uh, on the piece. And I think that what you do is very much outline some of the key dilemmas. But, uh, but as you also say, the cost of not participating, the cost of not, um, not doing something. Um, so thank you very much. Yeah, just before we, we uh, give the floor to the questions and answers, I, I just want to mention again, your final question uh, uh, about seizing the moment. Last week, uh, during the Research and Innovation Days, the European Commission announced that gender equality plans will be uh, a, a requirement for participation in the next Horizon Europe uh, 
uh, research program. So I think that we, we are in the right moment. We, we have to take this opportunity. And uh, as you say, is it better to leave it to non-feminists? So I think that uh, we are almost there. So let's see uh, if we have questions. Uh, Natasha, I think that you will uh, be reading the questions to Fiona. Yeah, first of all, uh, hello to everybody and good morning also from my side. My name is uh, Natasha Sega and I am part of the EG Academy Consortium uh, with Smart Venice. Uh, okay, so we have uh, already some good questions from our attendees. Um, I will read the, the first one from Dawn Bonfield. Uh, so she asked uh, if would the term gender devaluation apply to my own engineering sector where women try not to be seen as women, but only as engineers? And then they devalue their gendered input to engineering to detrimental effect. It's a very good question. Um, I wonder, Natasha, if you want to gather up a few of them. Yeah, sure. Um, um, and then I'll, I'll have a go. Mm -hmm. Then we have a question from Lucy. Uh, that uh, first of all, thank you for this your wonderful and reflexive presentation. And she tells that they are currently designing the training on leadership for women and mid management and senior management levels in university. And she asks, uh, from your extensive experience, what would, would be your advice to a woman considering taking on a senior management role in her institution? And I would uh, like uh, close this first session uh, of question with a question from Lena that asks how can feministic leadership be executed without second and third higher leadership position and without an official gender equality policy in a university where women make a majority? And we start with these three very intense questions and then we can move on. They're very, uh, thank you very much. They're, they're fantastic questions. Um, and I think I'd, I'd also like, if possible, uh, to hear a response from the people who've asked the question after, after I've done that. Um, so the first question, which was about um, gender devaluation in engineering. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the way that I've understood that is that the, the, the questioner is saying that if in fact, um, women engineers themselves devalue their own gender in the sense that they, they try to, 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 to engineer like men, um, to use, to paraphrase Judy Wiseman. Um, but actually in many ways they can't, you can't fully uh, escape uh, gender, can you? Um, I know that these are some of the, um, uh, I just think some of the, the main issues um, in that, in, in things like engineering, um, even the same behavior and the same practices and the same achievements will be viewed differently uh, if you're a man or you're a woman. So you can uh, behave like a man, uh, but even so your performance will be judged in a different way to a similarly situated uh, man in those sorts of processes uh, of uh, gender devaluation. Um, so I don't know that it's a, a kind of question as such, apart from to say, yes, that they are processes of gender devaluation that we need to look at. Um, I don't know what the answer is to that. Um, moving on to um, Lucy's question uh, about what advice um, would I give um, to somebody that was um, thinking about taking on a, a, a sort of significant uh, management role. Um, and I think I'd have a number of um, bits of advice. Um, and again, I'd be interested in, in Lucy and others' uh, own advice as well. The first thing is I would bargain hard. Um, so I would... Um, be sure 
that you have taken on board the fact that they are very demanding roles and I would not undersell myself uh, and I would make sure that there was support in place and that also um, in the kind of situation I'm in where I served in that management role but wanted to go back to active research that there are resources in place for you to do that as well. So I would, um, that's what I would do, I would bargain hard, uh, not under yourself, uh, undersell yourself, be be confident about uh, about your worth. Secondly, I would um, look for other sorts of support. So I have always found um, that I've had very, very good mentors. Um, and I've had mentors in terms of people who are more experienced than me, but at the same level, um, as well as senior mentors. And I always try and also get somebody that will mentor me from from below, if you like. So more junior people trying to keep you know, my feet to the fire. So have lots of uh, support in place. If necessary, through your networks, people who are doing a similar job in a different institution, because there'll be times when you, you just can't share what you're going through with anybody else that's in the institution. And one of the losses, if you like, is often you're cut off from your academic friendship circles because you can't go to them and go, oh, guess what the vice principal did today or, or whatever. You, you've, you've got to keep things uh, to yourself. So as I say, so it's about getting the resources in place, getting lots of support, keeping a strong sense of your own goals, um, concentrate on some early wins, some low hanging fruit, um, don't get too discouraged that, that wins are, are tend to be small rather than large and can be reversed. And I really like the point that Maria made, the quote, um, which was, yeah, they're small wins, but you've got to start somewhere. And, you know, I'll settle for that for the moment. OK, thanks. Uh, and then the last question is about how feminists can... Um, be part of reform efforts without either having a, a, an official gender equality role in an institution or be in a management position. <coughs> and I think there are lots of ways of doing that in terms of, I think, going back to Sarah Ahmed, living a feminist life. Um, so we know that change happens in all sorts of different ways. It can happen top down. It can happen, you know, as I did somewhere in the middle where you're trying to disrupt things and change also happens from the bottom up. So um, I think there are all sorts of ways in which we can exercise feminist leadership on an everyday level, uh, just in our own practice, in our relationships with others uh, and so on. Thanks. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you very much. I think um, you, your answer were fully um, centering the, the questions from our attendees. Um, we have some more um, from, from the participants. I will start with the one from Lut that asks, um, that underlined that your talk um, is focusing also the importance of the self-care and mutual support among feminists. And what would be your recommendation in terms of self-care as a feminist value for change agents? Continuing on this um, uh, on this uh, top on this line of feminist support, um, the Lina asks if there are any academic feminist leader networks or foundation that promotes that, and and Milika asks if you uh, can tell us how your feminist colleagues react to your work in your position of a leader. Did you experience solidarity and support from them? Um, I would stop here and then we have a final round of questions. Hi there, another great set of questions. Thanks very much indeed. It's, it's um, uh, really thought provoking. <clears throat> so the point about self-care, and of course we know as feminists that, 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 that um, Self-care is, is, is a feminist act and a revolutionary act, and, and we should be thinking about that. I think I'm rather better at telling others how to self-care than I am about practicing it myself. Um, but I think it would be that. It would be about having a sense of boundaries um, and recognising that there are times when you need to take a break. You need to, sorry, 
<coughs> recharge your batteries, that you can't be responsible uh, for everything. Um, so whether that's ensuring that you have at least one day off a week, whether that means that you you book tickets for something and you don't let your phone work in that um, on that day. And I think it's also about, I think, again, it ties up with this question around the gendered nature of service. I think as, as women and as feminists, we can end up feeling responsible for everything. Um, and I think that we do need to just hold on to the fact that there are other people, uh, that you aren't responsible for fixing everything, uh, that you do what you can, uh, but that you, you know, you hold on to um, your own sel sense of self um, and your own health uh, and, and so on. Um, part of self-care I've always found quite useful is, is having a sense of humour. <laughs> So sometimes just don't fight everything, sometimes deflect it with sense of humour. So the, the, the old professor who was a bit like, you know, your, your um, politically incorrect old uncle, I have told that story over and over again to his detriment in, in lots of public spaces. Um, so, you know, I think you don't have to fight every battle. Sometimes you can use humour to, to deflect. Uh, in terms of the question about um, is there a network for academic uh, feminist leaders? <clears throat> I'm not sure there is. I mean, I I have my own little network of, of, of people and I don't know. Um, um, I don't think there is one. Uh, I think it would be great um, as more feminists are considering this as a form of activism for there to be some kind of network in place and certainly when I've had these conversations with people I've been part of a project with um, University of Edinburgh and Ambedkar University in Delhi and one of the things is that I've um, ended up having a great relationship with the Dean of uh, Human Sciences there who's also a feminist uh, and we've we've written a little north-south conversation and things but being able to just share those experiences being able to if you like let your guard down and and, and, and speak in less diplomatic terms about what you're experiencing is, is incredibly helpful. And in fact, it was Krishna Menon who talked about her work being viewed as housework, uh, uncreative housework by others. And then the final question about how have I found my feminist colleagues and how do they react? Um, and I think that there are uh, a variety of responses and I think that those responses also match on to if you like the variety of perspectives that feminists come uh, from uh, and indeed their own views of whether you should engage with the neoliberal uh, academy, um, um, whether they are attentive to the kinds of compromises that are made in terms of a tempered radical strategy. So I've had both support and um, and lack of support. Um, uh, I've had some fantastic support, but I've also had uh, feminist colleagues who I think would hold me to a much higher standard uh, than they would hold anybody else. Uh, feminist colleagues who I think have been very disappointed in me uh, and, and sometimes, um, and particularly with that third vignette, the, the business about um, uh, the hostile environment and compliance with uh, the universities, um, the, uh, sorry, the, well, the universities and the government's uh, migration uh, monitoring. Um, yes, uh, I didn't have many feminist friends uh, in that particular time. Um, so yes, so I think some solidarity and some not. Um, and, you know, it's to be, it's to be expected. But I've also had, um, feminist colleagues on both the professional services side and the academic side who have said that they have seen me as a role model and ha it has made them feel that they want to to do something um, as a result of seeing me there and I'm always willing to say I'm wrong you know and I think that goes back to the feminist thing I'm well I think you've got to be kind of quite careful <laughs> you know in terms of showing vulnerability but I've I've always been of the view that I am uh, working with incredibly intelligent people uh, and why I would think that I had the answer. So I've tried to um, 
have a management style that's about coaching and, and collaboration and co-production, whilst also being aware that the book stops with me. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much for read it. Um, so let's proceed. We have so many questions. I, I hope we will manage to, to answer all of them. So let's start again from the one from Leila that asks, how can we prevent the depolitization of feminist leadership principles once they enter in institution? In her experience, once these concepts enter institution, they become aligned to the framework and agendas already driving that institution. They become deleted or codified, reduced to the to com competency frameworks and lose their fit. Um, then Mike can ask, uh, which from your chair is the feminist leader's greatest asset and the greatest inhibition also. We continue with the one uh, from Margarida that uh, first of all, thank you for this, your inspiring talk. And uh, she asked uh, if you see a temper radical strategy as the one that value asking for support to create a corresponsible agenda and a sense of inclusion. Her idea is that a temperate radical can value what she calls a share leadership. And let's run to the last one of this session, uh, to the question of Damilo asking, uh, uh, what strategy do you propose for young researchers to connect with good mentors especially in situations where efforts have been made with minimal positive results. This was linked to your um, suggestion of having a good mentorship. Gosh, what a, another set of, of good but very thought-provoking questions. I'm not going to be able to do uh, justice uh, to, 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 to all of them. Um, so the question from um, uh, Leila about depoliticization. Um, of feminist leadership principles once they enter institutions. And of course, this is the this is the great dilemma, this is the big debate that goes on. Um, and, and I suppose I don't disagree. Um, I think that um, depoliticization is something that constantly happens as part of institutionalization. Um, but I found um, Janet Newman's discussion of neoliberalism very helpful in this respect um, of seeing, if you like, feminisms and neoliberalism or feminisms and, you know, the academy as flexing each other. So that what we see is both, if you like, the impact of the institution on uh, feminist leadership principles and practices, but we also see in turn the impact of uh, feminist leadership principles and practices on the institution. So I suppose my short answer would be just just kind of vigilance uh, and the fact that that um, I think that the the dilemmas of co-optation and dilution are ever present. Um, I think we need to, to be able to challenge, uh, we need to be able to refresh and regroup. But I suppose I come back to the question that I um, closed my talk with, which is, you know, is it is it better then to leave it to non-feminists to steer, shape and exert power in the academy? Or do we, you know, take these messy compromises, these kind of the ambivalence, the ethics of ambivalence that we have to take as as uh, feminist um, manager leaders in the academy. Um, you know, do we just keep going with this messiness um, because there is the possibility of, of change that matters, of making a difference that matters. Um, greatest asset and greatest liability of, of, um, of a feminist uh, leadership style. I think in some senses I've, I've, I've already mentioned this, which, which is I think vulnerability or being open to our vulnerabilities. I think that it's a great asset um, in terms of um, building a, an enabling environment um, of um, being uh, sensitive and attentive um, to our colleagues, um, 
I think it's also the greatest um, uh, shortfall or liability in that I think that vulnerability can sometimes be interpreted, particularly managers, um, leaders higher up the uh, hierarchy as, as being somehow a sign of, of, of weakness. Um, and there is a great, um, so I think there's a kind of dichotomy in, in that, or a, a contradiction rather, in that there's um, a lot of lip service paid to, to more emotionally intelligent forms of uh, management and leadership. And I put feminist um, uh, leadership style in, in there, whilst also holding on to, you know, the, the very, very strong pull of muscular <laughs> leadership. Uh, and certainly I was given a management coach at one stage to do a 360 degree review and most of it was positive. But one of it was that I was too consultative and, um, you know, I needed on this this matrix of of leadership styles. I needed to to move out of the the um, consultative model into the directive uh, 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 part of the, the, the matrix. And you had to argue that actually that wasn't an effective style of, of, of leadership or management, particularly in a university with knowledge workers. So, I mean, yeah. So I, I think vulnerability and openness are both, are both a strength and a weakness. And then finally, the, um, no, not finally, the next one uh, about um, the kind of links between a tempered radical strategy and, and a kind of shared leadership model. And I think the two do work together very well. Um, I don't know whether in the kind of original uh, formulation of the tempered radical by Myerson and, and, um, and Scully, whether that would necessarily follow, perhaps you need to have that kind of the feminist bridge that you would bring those two together. So yes, I do see a lot of, of, of residence and attractiveness in, in that model. And then finally, the strategy for young researchers to get good mentors. Um, so I think the thing to remember is that you don't always have to have a mentor in your own institution. Um, I think you should call upon um, senior uh, women. Um, now that rolls back a bit on my self-care point earlier on. I think as senior women, you are responsible, you have a responsibility when there are so few of you um, to, to do what you can in terms of mentoring, sponsoring and so on. But I think also you can find through um, feminist ne networks so things like, you know, the European um, Conference on Politics and Gender, for, as a case in point, you will find uh, the opportunity for cross institutional mentorship there. Um, and I think that that's what you should do. And having having more than one mentor, having a feminist mentor, but also if you can find a, you know, a powerful <clears throat> male ally as well, uh, then um, that's what you should do. Then you manage them. Um, you are proactive with them. You have a, a short agenda and you, uh, you, you manage them. OK. Thank you very much, Fiona. Um, I think we are perfect on time uh, to have a final uh, Thank you. Thank you very much for your, your comprehensive answers. I leave the floor now to, to Maria uh, to close this session. And I thank you, you both uh, for your amazing talk and inspiring food for thought. Thank you very much, Natasha. Um, just some uh, final words to close this session and to summarize uh, uh, what we have been discussing. I would say that first, the importance of seizing the moment. As we mentioned, we have some uh, advantages in the moment we are living now with this announcement from the European Commission, but we can not ignore some uh, also difficulties that we have ahead. We can think about the, the case of Hungary or Poland with, where anti-feminism uh, discourses are, are, are coming out and anti-feminism uh, policies even. So we have to seize the moment and, and, and uh, go for the second point, which is exercise the power helpfully. So we need to uh, build alliances between between uh, different uh, feminist leaders, between different uh, temper radicals who can be uh, formal leaders, who can be senior leaders, but can be also middle managers. 
and uh, people who think out of the box, who are uh, exercising the everyday leadership. Um, uh, I took uh, one of the uh, of Fiona's uh, advice. Uh, Look for support. So let's support each other. So let's uh, uh, let's uh, bet for academic care and care each other. And I think some of the questions that we had in the in the panel came from some of the uh, participants in the Felice mentoring program that we are running under Gideon roles, where, uh, as you mentioned, Fiona, uh, the mentees that are participating in the in the program are coming from the six gender. Uh, uh, quality plans implementers uh, within gearing roles and they have both mentors within their own institutions but they also have mentors in other institutions across the consortium because it is also important as you mentioned to share with others so uh, I think this is an important point uh, to have a good mentor and to look for, for support. Um, also, uh, I like the, the idea of using humor because uh, we mentioned in, we had a, a, a training on resistances also uh, led by uh, the Academy with Gideon Rose and uh, humor emerged not only as a tool but also, but also as a huge resistance when sexy humor is used to devaluate the, the feminist uh, uh, discourse at the institution. So I think that we have to work on humor. Uh, uh, to foster humor as a, as a tool, but also to, to beat the, the resistance. And I will end by calling for, uh, colla uh, calling for collaboration among us. Uh, there are some participants from other sister projects on a structural change uh, across Europe, but uh, also with other feminist uh, activists uh, in other fields of knowledge, not only necessarily involved in, in leadership or in, in sister projects, uh, let's build alliances and let's work together to to achieve the change. So thank you very much, Fiona. It was a pleasure to have you here, and thank you all for uh, your participation, for your challenging questions, and uh, we will see you around. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, everybody.